Morning everyone and welcome to this uh, Green Alliance event. I'm we're delighted to be uh, joined today by the Secretary of State for the Environment, uh, Food and Rural Affairs, George Eustace, uh, who's been MP for Camberwon and Red Roof since 2010 and a DEFRA minister since 2013 with a, a short and interesting break where he made some very uh, illuminating comments on trade policy. Uh, after the Secretary of State has spoken, uh, There'll be short responses from Becky Spate, Chief Executive of the RSPB, and Tanya Steele, Chief Executive of WWF. Uh, and then we'll have a panel discussion for about 20 minutes and uh, 20 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. Uh, if you'd like to pose a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can use the chat function to, as it were, talk among yourselves, but we won't be monitoring the chat function. We'll be looking at the questions posed. And if you like a particular question that's been posed by somebody, then you can upvote it by pressing the thumbs up. And it's more likely to be asked at the end by uh, Ruth Chambers, who will be collating the question. Um, the last thing to say is that if you'd like to tweet during the event, please do so. And the hashtag for the event is a hashtag G A event hashtag G A event, uh, and now it gives me great pleasure to welcome the Secretary of State, who's going to talk, I think, for about ten to fifteen minutes. Apologies. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sean, and good every good morning, everyone. And um, I'd like to begin by thanking all of those who've been working hard to protect and enhance our environment over the past few months. It's great to see sites open to the public again, but I'm also conscious that this crisis has had financial impacts on many organizations, impacts on membership, and that you face real pressures in keeping nature reserves and parks open. The impacts of this pandemic will be felt deeply for many years, but the experience has also led people to appreciate the difference that nature makes to our lives in a new way. There is an increased awareness of the link between our own health and that of the planet. Studies across the spectrum, from health to financial risk, remind us that in our, it is in our best interest to look after nature. We know that a connection with nature contributes to well-being and improved mental health. So starting this autumn, we'll be investing a further four million pounds in a two-year pilot to bring green prescribing to four urban and rural areas that have been hit the hardest by the coronavirus. And then we want to scale that project up. When we destroy nature, we undermine our very foundations. Every country faces a choice as they map out their recovery. Store up problems by sticking with the status quo or get back on our feet by building back better and greener. In our own country, nature has been in decline for decades. The last breeding populations of Kentish plovers were lost in 1928. Between 1932 and 1984, we lost 97% of our species rich grassland. And heathlands have fared little better. Five species of butterfly have become extinct in the last 150 years. And our farmland bird indicator stands at less than half its value of 1970, following a precipitous decline during the 1980s and 90s and further losses since. This government's pledge is not only to stem the tide of loss, but to turn it around, to leave the environment in a better state than we found it. In a few months time, the transition period will come to an end and the UK will be free to chart a new course. It is an important moment for policymakers and nowhere more so than in our approach to the environment. As a country, we have opted for the freedom to act and to decide our own environmental policies in future. But with that freedom comes new responsibilities. It will no longer be the case that the UK can register a position as an outlier around the table during the development of a particular EU dossier, safe in the knowledge that a QMV voting system will always drive out something more nuanced. Instead, we must learn to temper our own approach. And we will not be able to hide behind EU law where there are difficult decisions to make, or indeed blame the EU when things don't work. Instead, we must level with people about difficult decisions and take responsibility for delivering the change that is required. Tackling environmental challenges requires a long-term approach and political commitment to that journey, even when the political cycle can be short-term. 
So we will shortly be publishing a paper that sets out our approach to setting long-term targets on biodiversity, waste, water and air quality through the new Environment Bill so that they are established in time by October 2022. And we will, in the next few days, launch the appointment campaign for the first chair of the OEP so that they will be in place to lead a new public body in 2021 to scrutinise and assess progress towards these targets. When it comes to our new approach to the environment, we must have an appreciation of what worked in the EU in the past and also what didn't work. Where there were approaches inside the EU that helped our environment, we should recognise these and be willing to borrow features from them. But there is no point leaving the EU to keep everything the same. The old model has not stopped the decline in our natural world. And we must therefore challenge ourselves to think creatively, to innovate, and to consciously avoid clinging to processes and procedures just because they are familiar. On environmental policy, we can do better or differently, and I want to open a discussion in this space today. Now, of course, leaving the EU table does not mean retreating from our role in the world. In fact, it means we should redouble our efforts globally. Long before we joined the EU, the UK was a driving force in establishing other international conventions to help our natural environment. We turned the IWC from being a forum that decided quotas for whaling to being a force for conservation. We were in at the beginning when CITES was first mooted in 1963 to protect endangered species, when Ramsar protected wetland areas in 1971, when the Bern Convention protected habitats and species, when the Convention on the Conservation of African Eurasian Migratory Water Birds was introduced, and later when CBD was established, Safeguard Biodiversity. Next year, we will host COP26, where we will be seeking to secure international action on climate change and biodiversity loss, which will include emphasising the role of nature-based solutions in that global endeavour, such as our work to tackle illegal deforestation and promote sustainable supply chain. So while the environmental legislation we currently have is often credited to flagship EU directives like the Habitats Directive or the Birds Directive, these directives themselves were often principally about implementing at an EU level things that had already been agreed internationally through other international conventions like the Bern Convention. International conventions that the UK was always part of will remain part of and where we will continue to drive international consensus for change and progress. Now a few years ago, shortly after becoming a minister in DEFRA, I remember being given a huge report running to hundreds of pages, setting out exactly what the UK was doing to deliver its obligations under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. It was a formidable piece of work which listed every piece of legislation we already had, including laws like the Protection of Seals Act 1970. But a covering note to the document recommended that I need not waste my time reading it because it said nothing new, committed us to nothing we were not already doing, and was mainly a summary of the laws and measures that we already had in place dating back to the 1960s. And when I asked what the purpose of the document was, the answer came back that it's just a requirement of EU law. Now, EU environmental has always had good intentions, but there are also negative consequences to attempting to legislate for these matters at a supranational level. It tends to lead to a culture of perpetual legal jeopardy, where national governments can become reluctant to try new things, or make new commitments, for fear of irreversible and unpredictable legal risk. And this in turn creates a culture where there are frankly too many lawyers and not enough scientists and too many reports but not enough action. So as we chart a new course for our approach to protecting the environment, we can retain the features that worked and change the features that didn't. We should recognize that the environment and our ecosystems are a complex web of interactions that mankind will never fully understand let alone manage. We should rebalance the way we approach policy development 
with more focus on science and technical knowledge and less time fretting about legal risks of doing something new or innovative. We should have fewer reports that say nothing new, but more new ideas that we should actually try. And we should be willing to try new approaches, safe in the knowledge that we will have the power to change things again if a particular policy idea fails. Our targets framework should give us a clear set of objectives to work to, but to meet those targets, our approach to policy development must be agile or iterative and must create the space for more experimentation and innovation. Now, if we are to protect species and habitats and also deliver biodiversity net gain, we need to properly understand the science to inform these crucial decisions. And we should ask ourselves whether the current processes are as effective or efficient as they could be. Is there sufficient access to data and knowledge to know which species should be assessed? If we had better, more up-to-date data about things such as flood risk or habitats, species and air quality, could we design plans for sustainable new projects and developments more effectively and efficiently than we do now? Do we have enough focus on improvements at a landscape scale? Do local authorities adopt a consistent approach to the screening process through environmental impact assessment? Do they have the capability to engage over the lifetime of a project? Later this autumn, we will be launching a new consultation on changing our approach to environmental assessment and mitigation in the planning system. If we can front load ecological considerations in the planning development process, we can protect more of what is precious. We can set out which habitats and species will always be off limit, so everyone knows where they stand. And we can add to that list where we want better protection for species that are characteristic for our country and critical to our ecosystems that the EU has sometimes overlooked. Things like water voles, red squirrels, adders, and pine martins. We want everyone to be able to access an accurate centralized body of data on species populations so that taking nature into account is the first speedy step to an application. So today I can announce a five million pound pilot on establishing a new natural capital and ecosystem assessment. At the heart of our approach is a simple premise. We can improve the baseline understanding of habitats and species abundance across the country in every planning authority, then we can make better decisions towards achieving our vision to leave the environment in a better state than we found it. We can reduce process while simultaneously improving the quality of the data that informs our decisions. We can move quickly to rule out issues that we don't know don't exist, leaving us time to focus on the protections that matter most for the species and habitats most affected. So we ensure that new developments really do mean a net gain for people and for nature. In conclusion, in recent decades, our approach to environmental regulation, particularly in regards to nature and biodiversity, has been to protect what is left and to stem the tide of decline. We've had some successes so far as that approach goes and should acknowledge this. However, if we really want to realize the aspirations that the public have for nature, then we need policies that will not only protect, but that will build back with more diverse habitats that lead to a greater abundance of those species currently in decline. Delivering this change is what lies at the heart of our approach to future farming policy, our approach to biodiversity net gain in the planning system, and also behind other initiatives like highly protected marine areas that we intend to pilot. Building back greener means what it says, and I want to work with all of you to make that happen. Thank you. Great, thank you, Secretary of State. And I now turn to uh, Becky Spate from the RSBB. And Becky, I think some people have uh, expressed concern in the last few months that the uh, environmental momentum of the government is, is stalling somewhat. Has, have, has the Secretary of State's speech uh, allayed any of those concerns for you? Well, it's all about reading the mood music. I was interested in um, something that the uh, Secretary of State said in his, um, 
accompanying press statement, which is one, about wanting to see more ecologists and hear from more ecologists. And um, I suppose I'm trying to think like an ecologist as I respond to this and look at the overall system, join the dots up and kind of look at the spaces in between what's being said as well. And our Secretary of State laid out very clearly the kind of starting position, which is that nature is not in a good state. It's declined particularly over the last 50 years. Um, and we are one of the most nature depleted countries in the world with the 29th lowest um, of 218 countries assessed in 2016. So it does feel as though things have been going in the wrong direction. Um, and uh, is it all the fault of the EU? Well, probably it's been the, e the agri-environment schemes which uh, came in under CAP have certainly kind of, from our assessment, sort of held the line. They haven't reversed the decline, but they have held the line for some species. And that's why we're quite worried about the rumours that some of the, 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 the CAP greening uh, policies might be removed without anything to replace them and that would put at risk um, thousands of acres of, of habitat that has been created um, and uh, and equally the kind of the lack of um, the lack of commitment to a non-regression um, commitment in the environment bill is a worry as well because we just want to say that you know we're not going to go backwards we're going to at least stay the same and hopefully as the Secretary of State set out uh, improve the position uh, so in the in the face of that kind of of that decline and in the face of the urgency of the climate and ecological crisis then we know that big change is required um, and the environment bill and agriculture bill and the fisheries bill of course offer huge opportunities for that but then along comes a zoonotic disease so something that has been created out of our relationship with nature um, and you know the world economic forum starts saying that the top five global risks are environmental um, so i think we can all agree that we do need this more resilient economy based on healthy communities and a thriving natural world and that that means really long-term investment long-term thinking big ambition and a real chance to bend the curve in terms of nature's decline that decline that we talked about earlier but of course, coming out of that COVID crisis, we absolutely need jobs. So can nature help deliver that as well? And we know we've got 330 shovel ready projects. We know that would create 10,000 jobs. We know there's a further 15,000 jobs that would be required to deliver all the ambitions set out in the 25 year environment plan, uh, including the proposed creation of a national nature service. But that needs an investment along the lines of about 600 million pounds a year over a 10 year period. So what's being promised so far just kind it doesn't touch the sides of that so that the ambition and the scale of investment needs to be much much bigger and instead we find ourselves in a place where we're talking a lot about deregulation so um, even though 93 percent of conservative voters said they want to maintain or strengthen the protection for habitats and wildlife going forward we find ourselves in a place where we're talking a lot about project speed um, and and the need to review uh, EIAs for example um, now, you know, there is potential there to improve the system, improve the EIAs, but we should be clear that only 0.1% uh, of, of planning applications going to local authorities in 2017 17 and 18 actually required an environmental statement. So it's a very, very small percentage that we're talking about. And of course, national, uh, national infrastructure projects require an EIA as well, but I think we would want that to continue. So we're actually talking about quite a small percentage. So this kind of sense that sort of reviewing uh, environmental aspects of the planning system is what's going to kind of shift things is perhaps slightly misplaced. Um, and we know from the Letwin review in 2018, that was found not to be the case in terms of what was slowing down the planning system. It wasn't kind of environmental protection that was slowing it down. Um, and equally worrying is the kind of free ports move, so the move towards free ports, and that could be a return to the kind of the bad days of the 70s and 80s when we had kind of concreting over of really important mud flats for breeding birds and so on, just to create more car parking space. So the science and data approach is welcome, but we need to be careful that we're not going backwards on this. Um, and that deregulation kind of thrust combined with um, uh, the rumours of needing to clarify the Office for Environmental Protection and its role, um, the fact that we're only just getting going 
in terms of recruiting the chair despite having identified that governance gap back in 2017 uh, means that we're really worried about this kind of watering down feel that's going on at the moment around what did feel like a really ambitious set of bills so um, you know uh, that the environmental land management schemes for example at the moment under the agriculture bill and, and really important to delivery of the ambition set out in the environment bill um, talks a lot about kind of a transition period it's not clear what that's going to quite look like that's kind of frightening farmers at the moment as well um, and then you know in terms of the ambition at the other end of uh, delivery the tier two tier three that's looking like it's being watered down as well so just kind of concern around that and concern around the fact that trade has not been fully resolved we've had the stop of this trade um, and agriculture commission coming forward but you know it's no clear strong environmental voice on that so while we would welcome things like the, the £4 million investment in nature prescriptions um, and the way in which that addresses the access issues that Glover realised in the review of national parks and AOMBs, um, you know, we worry that nature actually won't be there to prescribe for much longer. So, you know, the big concern is what is happening to nature. So as an ecologist, you know, we have to ask, does the action match the rhetoric? What patterns are we seeing? And actually we're seeing patterns that show a kind of watering down around the appetite for a green Brexit, a watering down of the appetite for a green economic recovery, um, and certainly looking towards the global position and COP26, which I know Tanya is going to talk about in a minute, um, we still see that our peatlands, for example, are losing 350,000 tonnes of carbon a year no commitment yet on stopping burning of those uh, of those peatlands and no commitment yet to the 30 percent of land and seas to be well protected and managed for nature by 2030 which other countries are signing up to at the moment so um we don't see a kind of a, a major recovery plan for seas and we certainly aren't seeing the major investment beyond that which already exists for nature climate solutions so of course we will engage with project speed and trying to improve the planning system and of course we will engage with the uh, the welcome four million pounds committed to nature prescriptions um, but we really need to see kind of a lot more deeds not just words if we want to be propositional around a real green recovery then we absolutely need to be delivering it and i suppose thinking like an ecologist looking at the system at the moment and the gaps between the points we would want to see more ambition more heart and certainly more investment in nature in order to deliver that um, and really this should feel like a turning point you know everything is pointing in the direction of really putting nature at the heart of this resilient recovery and actually it feels more like more of the same or in fact going backwards and that is the worry so we stand ready to work with the secretary of state to really turn this into a turning point but at the moment it doesn't feel quite like that thank you becky it was, uh, there's a lot there and i will give the secretary of state a chance to to, to come back but before turning to Tanya can I just pick up one thing from Becky's uh, uh, long list um, which is this point about non-regression which I think has been mystifying a lot of us which is that the Conservative manifesto is absolutely clear that there will be no compromising on environmental uh, animal welfare or food standards and yet there's been a consistent refusal to put that in legislation and, and a lot of us simply don't understand why that's the case. I wonder if you just respond on that point and then I'll give you a chance to come back on some of Becky's other points after Tanya's spoken. Oh, just take me off mute. Um, sure, well look, um, it's in our manifesto um, very, very clearly that in all of our uh, trade agreements uh, then we will, we will seek to protect, you know, we will protect food standards, our high standards of um, food safety, animal welfare standards and the environment. That's there in our manifesto. And the way that you, you know, deliver that really is through your mandate and the stance that you take to those negotiations. Um, so we don't think it's necessarily appropriate to put that on the face of the bill. And not least uh, the way it was done, it could render a few existing uh, trade agreements to be unlawful, uh, which would be a, you know, potentially a problem in itself. So we, we think the important thing is that that's an approach that we take into those trade uh, um, negotiations. Uh, we've been working closely with the Department for International Trade uh, to identify ways of um, making that work in practice, both through our approach to the SPS chapter, uh, which deals with food safety in particular, but also in our approach, obviously, to tariff policy, uh, which is uh, another approach. And um, we've also then established the you know, Food Standards Commission, which is something that I know uh, green NGOs and uh, groups like the NFU had long called for, and that's uh, going to be launched uh, later this week. 
Um, turning, do you want me to addressing some of Becky's um, uh, Perhaps uh, um, we'll return to you in a minute. I'll, I'll ask Tanya to respond Tanya, if sure, first, sure. And, and, then, uh, and, and then you can res respond to some of Becky's, Becky's points. Just, just a general reminder, if people want to tweet, it's hashtag GA event. Uh, and also, if you want to pose a question, then please do it in the Q&A rather than the chat function. Uh, Tanya. Thank you, Sean. And um, Secretary of State, thank you uh, for your uh, opening comments and uh, your outline in terms of um, the direction ahead. And Becky, also for your comments as well. I guess, Secretary of State, in listening to your speech, for me, I was looking for the balance between both the ambition in terms of uh, setting out both the scale of crisis here at home as well as abroad, and then indeed the action. Uh, importantly, we know this is about uh, a timeline for policy and indeed investment to start to both underpin and drive that, that, that change for the future. I think we were very conscious of the words uh, of the PM from just a few weeks ago, building back greener and indeed building back a more beautiful Britain. And the question is, is this a path for recovery or actually are we at a crossroad where that path really isn't ambitious enough and is it in danger of passing on the burden of inaction uh, to our children. Um, any basics in investment tells us that we cannot discount our children's futures and we need to invest very much today in order to build up the returns for the future. Uh, importantly, uh, Secretary of State and both Becky, I know you highlighted the importance of the fact that we're in the midst of a, 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 a public health as well as a planetary health crisis. Uh, we've seen this nowhere better recently uh, than the Amazon, uh, where we've seen another 3,000 square kilometres um, of forest cleared. That's equivalent to 50,000 football pitches in the first six months of this year. That's 26% up on the previous year. And we know we've already lost 20% of the Amazon. This is our natural planet's lungs, if you like. If we lose a further 5%, science tells us that we will lose the fight on climate change. And that's the kind of backdrop of shifts and planetary pressures that we see. But of course, this does require very much a response here at home. We know that every decision, both policy as well as consumer, we make in terms of the nature and standards of our agricultural system, the basis on which we trade and the standards we set uh, for others to trade with us, right the way through to our own economic recovery. We have a um, very ambitious net zero commitment, but in terms of meeting that, we know we need uh, not just the ambition, but indeed the depth of the policies in order to deliver them. I guess in terms of for the, the, the priorities that I hope you will look to accelerate and indeed off the back of your commitments this morning is first of all both the right laws as well as the policies in place and um, we've heard that the environment bill is coming back in october which is um, gratefully heard that's a real priority that's a very very ambitious uh, bill moving forward but the scale also backing that of agricultural reform ocean recovery is indeed essential we need the right investment, of course, and the right investment environment. Secretary of State, you've highlighted some investments this morning, but really in terms of the scale of this crisis, the scale of investment we know we will need in both nature-based solutions, but also in terms of the investment environment, in terms of meeting that net zero rule. Why on earth would we look to put in place infrastructure that does not meet our net zero commitments in the future? Again, thinking to future generations, we are deferring their futures and indeed their ability to tackle the crises that we have created to date. And then I guess finally in terms of global leadership, I uh, was delighted that you reminded us of really the very impressive uh, UK support over many years of really very impressive and important um, commitments across Ramsar, uh, whether it's across the uh, International Whaling Commission, whether it's through the establishment of the CBD. We also did this, of course, in terms of the Climate Change Act. We would very much hope in terms of the UK's diplomatic efforts and indeed convening power as we roll into COP26. But part of that diplomatic effort we know has to be backed by our own ambitious uh, commitments and indeed action here at home. If we do want to think about brand Britain, I do believe we need to fuse both UK action at home as well as the calls for the change that we're asking around the world. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Tanya. So, Secretary of State, there's a lot to come back on. I think you could probably give a, another uh, speech longer than the first in responding to all, all those questions. But I wonder if you could sort of just focus at the beginning. Obviously, say anything, you, any points you think you want to pick up. But the, Becky raised a concern about the, um, the general decline in, in nature. We've got the, one of the most degraded uh, natural environments in, in the world. Uh, and yet, this whole sort of debate started with the Prime Minister's speech about Project Speed uh, on a, in an attack on sort of newt counting. And uh, Tanya has raised the concern about new infrastructure, whether it's going to be compatible with net zero. Do you, do you think that um, the government as a whole, from the Prime Minister down, kind of gets the need to couple the green recovery with, a, with nature's re re recovery and and a really successful COP26 and biodiversity COP. Is that, is that animating at the heart of government or is this a sort of a fringe interest in, in DEFRA? No, no, it very much is. I mean, right back in February when the Prime Minister appointed me to this role, he was clear this was his uh, number one priority with COP26 coming up. And um, you know, he's passionate about issues such as animal welfare and our environment and wants to see um, a green recovery as we emerge from the coronavirus. Indeed, I, I suspect will be, uh, will be a message that he returns to time and time again uh, over the next um, uh, uh, months and, um, and no doubt years. So it's very much uh, a central part of our agenda. And I would say that, you know, in, in terms of um, Becky's point around, you know, deregulation, she made the point that environmental impact assessments only apply to a, a small number of developments. But I guess that might be the, the point. Are we in danger of having a sort of tick box routine for certain projects but missing something bigger and more important on others? And if we had um, better data uh, right across a planning area, that could be used for all planning applications. And that could be used to inform biodiversity net gain so that we're not just about trying to uh, you know, protect, protect some species on some sites with some applications. It starts to become a whole approach that means we can build back nature and see greater abundance. And that's what this is about. So I can understand the, the apprehension that some people will feel as we you know, embark on a, uh, a new course and, and, and uh, propose certain changes. But I, I very much hope, and it's for us to do this, I very much hope that as we roll out our um, uh, various approaches, you will, you will see uh, that actually we are serious about this and we're serious about delivering. Indeed, later this morning, um, one of the meetings I've got is a cabinet subcommittee on climate change implementation. We'll be uh, talking about net zero, but also carbon budgets four and five and what we have to do to get there uh, across a whole range of sectors. Uh, it's an issue that um, is on our minds that we're focused on, notwithstanding everything else that is going on uh, in government. I think um, Becky made uh, a point as well around funding. And, you know, if I can just address this. Look, today, uh, yes, I've, I've announced a couple of uh, fairly modest ski pilots. One is a £4 million uh, pilot for uh, green, so, you know, green prescribing, uh, which I think can be uh, an important a factor in terms of helping mental health is something we'd like to upscale. The others being that uh, five million pound uh, pilot on natural capital. But you know, that's not the only funding in town. You have to set this against the fact that we have an annual cap budget for England alone that is two billion pounds a year. And we are about to embark on a very ambitious move to get away from arbitrary area-based subsidy payments to farmers and instead reward them for what they're doing for the environment. And you know, let me just uh, reassure you, we will not be scrapping those countryside stewardship, the Pillar 2 uh, schemes, prior to rolling out the new ELM scheme. Indeed, and we'll be saying more about this later in the year, one of the things we're looking at is whether we could expand uh, the scope of countryside stewardship as a stepping stone, stone to the future ELM scheme. Um, I think where the speculations come from is there's obviously then a, there's a separate set of rules, um, things like the, the so-called crop diversity rule that requires farmers to have certain proportions of certain crops grown. Um, these were um, uh, rightly dismissed uh, by green NGOs as greenwashing at the time that they were introduced. Uh, they've been ineffective, they've created a lot of bureaucracy, but haven't actually delivered anything for the environment. I can remember uh, uh, at one point when we were trying to work out how to implementing this, 
arguing with officials about whether a cabbage and a cauliflower were the same crop for the purposes of the three crop rule or whether they could be treated as uh, different crops. Um, I think you know it's not um, it's not an approach that's delivered for our environment. But countryside stewardship does, so we will expand it, and the future Elm scheme will do uh, better still. Um, and finally, on a point that um, uh, Tanya raised uh, about the Amazon and about rainforests, this is an agenda that I'm passionate about because she's absolutely right. When you lose these uh, ancient forests that are the lungs of the planet, you've lost them forever. And if we uh, lose much more, we will be in a um, critical uh, you know, decline as a, as, as a planet and our attempts to tackle climate change uh, will amount to nothing. So this is a, a very uh, important agenda. Uh, we commissioned the um, uh, GRI uh, report uh, from uh, Ian Cheshire. I think it's a very good report, made uh, lots of uh, good recommendations that we're studying closely across government, uh, but trying to uh, improve due diligence in the supply chain uh, so that we can tackle illegal um, forestation is going to be a, a very important part of our uh, international uh, agenda. Along, of course, as I've mentioned already, with uh, the big changes we're making in agriculture policy and our intention to have those uh, highly protected uh, marine areas as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Secretary State, will due diligence be part of the, uh, of the Environment Bill when it returns? And and also, as you know, we, we were very concerned that the Environment Bill didn't return before the summer recess. It, it was once the lodestar of the government's legislative program. Uh, we, we, will it return on sort of day one in, of the new session in September? Um, well, my uh, current expectation is that the Environment Bill will return um, probably in September um, at some point and to, to resume the committee stage. Um, and we want to get going with this as, uh, as quickly as we can. Obviously, the coronavirus has caused disruption to the parliamentary timetable, not just because Parliament was suspended for a period, but dealing with a uh, complex uh, bill such as the Environment Bill via Zoom uh, was going to create its um, practical challenges. And also there's been a, a need for certain emergency legislation as well. Um, across government, we are looking very, very closely at the um, GRI report and its recommendations. Um, you know, there's a, a possibility that uh, some of that uh, could be included in the Environment Bill, but we're not in the position yet of having uh, made those final decisions. Okay, and, and Becky mentioned uh, potential changes to the terms of the Office of Environmental Protection. As, as you know, there's a bit of concern that the Environment Bill might be significantly changed uh, in some ways. The OEP weakened, the, uh, um, the project speed sort of added to the Environment Bill, so it becomes some kind of environment and planning bill. Are, are you able to reassure us that that isn't the case, and the Environment Bill is going to return pretty much as it was, but if anything improved rather than uh, weakened? Uh, it'll certainly be improved. Um, so, um, you know, there'll be a few minor changes, but nothing um, significant. And as I said, uh, we are considering issues such as uh, due diligence in supply chains and uh, giving thought to uh, some of those areas. Um, but I, I but the fundamentals of it in terms of the OEP uh, will remain the same. Um, the only thing that we are, um, you know, looking at and um, not made any, you know, final uh, decisions is in this area, but it's just in terms of uh, a few uh, tweaks uh, to some of the clauses uh, around exactly how the OEP would work and exactly what um, uh, legal remedies are, are open to it, just to bring some consistency. Um, but there's no final decisions on that, but, um, but obviously um, when it returns to report stage, if we do decide to make those changes, uh, then we will uh, be publishing those at the time. Thank you. I'll ask Becky and Tanya to come back in a, in a moment uh, and then we'll have questions from the, the audience. One last question, as you mentioned the, the Cabinet Committee on Climate Change, I, I know there are two Cabinet Committees, is, is the meeting this afternoon of the Cabinet Committee the Prime Minister Chairs? Because I, I had heard that had only met, I think, only once. Uh, or is, is, this the, is this the main Cabinet Committee on Climate Change? It's the, the the subcommittee that deals with implementation. So, um, so I don't think it's the one. I don't think the prime minister will be chairing the one this afternoon. And, and has the main committee on climate change met only once? That sounds extraordinary, even given coronavirus. Um, well, we've had several meetings. I've attended quite a few meetings on climate change, which are cabinet subcommittee meetings. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Becky. Did you want to come back on any of the secretary of state's responses? Uh, 
yeah just in terms of um bringing more science and data you know to the to the kind of the planning system and the environmental um assessment process i mean i think that's only to be welcomed i mean obviously science and data is a huge kind of platform that we're probably not making the most of that we could but i i think in terms of kind of environmental assessment it's it's a really complex business as you'll appreciate um much of it is about kind of locality very local assessments um, and I think, you know, one of the big issues is that local authorities just don't have the capacity anymore. They often don't have ecologists um, on board in order to kind of lead this sort of um, this sort of process. So I would just urge um, the Secretary of State just to kind of appreciate that it, it's, it's about more than the better use of science and data, which I agree would be uh, really, really helpful. But it is about making sure that we have got in place uh, a system that appreciates the, the locality, the cumulative impacts in terms of um, what happens to species um, and the complexity of it as well. So just to kind of really re-emphasize that. Um, and I think around um, around that you mentioned the expansion of um, countryside stewardship as a way of uh, overseeing this, this transition. Again, I would just urge um, not to leave a gap I think there's a real risk around a gap of um, of, of of the the, the, the greening um, uh, the greening um, uh, approaches that you mentioned around things like crop diversity disappearing, and there actually being a gap, and we will see uh, farmers starting to kind of move away from um, the uh, the approaches they have taken so far in terms of habitat creation. And I think there is a real risk of loss around that, um, and, and particularly while the kind of reg regulatory baseline remains unclear that will sit below the kind of um the uh, environmental land management schemes you know i think there is a real risk around that transition period so i would just urge the secretary of state to be really careful about how that transition is handled and to absolutely hang on to the ambition around the environmental land management scheme because if we lose that ambition then we lose a major a major plank of being imp able to implement the 25-year environment plan 72 percent of our land is farmed so it's so fundamental to being able to deliver the kind of ambition that the secretary of state has talked about um and sorry, finally back, just back. sorry okay finally <laughs> i'll shut up thanks for saying you can come back on those those points thanks becky Yes, um, we've not lost any of the ambition um, in the environmental land management scheme. Indeed, what we want to uh, start doing is deploying certain components of it uh, sooner um, and um, to expand the countryside stewardship scheme so that becomes a stepping stone to the, to the future scheme. So um, we, we, we're far from losing our ambition. We want to get on with this. We're, we're, we're anxious to start the process, to begin the transition and to start uh, deploying um, those significant resources that we have on agriculture policy in different, better, more creative ways that deliver for our um, farmed environment. And, and more, more planners, more ecologists will definitely be making the case with the Treasury for this in the local government uh, settlement and, and for Natural England? Yes, I mean it's a point that I um, you know, raised in my, in my speech in fact, that we, we need to ask a question, do local authorities have the capacity and the capabilities to actually know what's before them or to understand what might or might not be needed in a in a screening assessment i think it is um quite a challenge should we be uh getting natural england more involved uh, in more of these processes should we be doing more for instance by way of um you know district licensing with a stronger role for uh, natural england in that um you know in that particular process so I, I agree that this is an area that we've um got to get right and it's potentially quite a weakness in the current system because we're relying on people to make assessments when they may not have the you know ability and the wherewithal to do that I mean, the other thing I'd make as a point in terms of the you know, funding that's, um, that's available, obviously the approach to biodiversity net gain is going to create a whole new uh, market in uh, conservation. And uh, we ought to be thinking about how we can uh, really use that well to really uh, you know, deploy the right kind of projects to get that biodiversity net gain that we seek. Thank you. Tanya, do you want to follow up anything before we go to questions? Just two, two very um, quick points, Secretary of State. Um, I guess we've perhaps talked a little bit less about trade, bearing in mind uh, the interest, um, the potential, uh, again, for Brand Britain, if you like. And I suppose 
for me to raise the question in terms of, I know we've heard a great deal about standards being made, uh, maintained, uh, environmental standards, production standards, animal welfare standards. Uh, the anxiety is that's not quite the same as allowing imports of a lower standard into the UK. We both know this is the first time in nearly 50 years that we've had the opportunity to negotiate these trade deals, but I think uh, there's obviously a ongoing concern in terms of the, the nature and the transparency uh, around those trade deals. And I guess secondly, and related to that, uh, any comments in terms of how important this is in terms of uh, our role as a global organization, not least in hosting COP26 and uh, the convention, working on the Convention on Biological Diversity. Secretary of State, you rightly highlighted um, that we know we need to not only halt the destruction of nature, we need to move into restoration mode. I'd probably put it stronger in terms of we need to give it back and we need to give it back to future generations of children. Can we equally be sure that both the trade deals uh, that we're striking uh, for our own um, environment moving forward, as well as the steps we're taking here at home in terms of planning out uh, our next steps with the Environment Bill, will look to meet those kind of commitments. Yes, well, as I said, we've, we've set out quite a clear position in our manifesto. And um, you know, the point that I'd make is obviously in recent decades, we've not actually been in control of these things at all. We have relied on the European Union to um, uh, strike trade agreements with us, uh, and they have, and um, they um, have already in some cases done trade agreements where they allow goods in that perhaps don't meet our standards, um, albeit in limited quantity. Now we um, have an opportunity, uh, taking back control of this area, to have a modern approach to trade agreements where standards including things uh, such as the environment and animal welfare can be a, a big feature of our asks of other countries when they're seeking access to the UK market. Uh, so there's an opportunity here to do things differently since we will be making these decisions and deciding our own mandate and there will inevitably be uh, a bigger role for the UK Parliament because it'll be the UK Parliament that holds the government to account uh, on these trade agreements Whereas before, of course, it was the European Council that held the Commission to account. So I think we're in a stronger position to get a better approach and a more modern approach to these trade agreements by having control of that ourselves as the UK. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, Ruth, we won't have time for many questions, I'm afraid. We will send all the questions and indeed the chat to the Secretary of State. Uh, but Ruth, what are the main questions and themes emerging? Thanks, Sean. So I think there are four main themes emerging. We've had over 100 questions, both on the day and in advance. So thanks, everybody, for submitting ideas. And the four main themes, it won't surprise you, are the planning reforms and how they relate to environmental protections and how they will enhance and not undermine protections. The Environment Bill, where is it and how ambitious is it going to be? Marrying global ambitions with domestic um, ambition and how we sort of do that and then the importance of nature to people. So those are the four, I think, clear themes coming out of the questions. Um, we've only got time probably for about three or four, so I'll, I'll just kind of rattle off for the first one, if that's okay, Secretary of State. And that's about mm -hmm. innovation. And the question is that we'd all agree that innovation is critical, but so is taking um, science-based decisions, as you rightly reminded us. Can you therefore um, assure us that you remain committed to the precautionary principle as a fundamental pillar of environmental legislation for the first question, please. And just to add to that, I think the concern is, is the precautionary, everybody talks about the precautionary principle, but the way the US has talked about the precautionary principle is less reassuring than the way we've practiced it for, for many years. So is it the precautionary principle as we know it? Um, well, the precautionary principle will be enshrined in the Environment Bill, and we are shortly going to be publishing uh, you know, guidance on that. But um, I don't think, um, I think often, often the, um, the danger of this area is that terms get used um, in an inappropriate way out of context. And so you tend to have this kind of um, hazard-based approach versus precautionary uh, approach. And the, what, what, what the precautionary principle actually means is that where there are gaps in the evidence, um, but, um, but where you can see the shape of things or potential risks, then you should not allow 
gaps in the evidence to be an excuse for failing to act. Uh, so that is what the precautionary principle is. Um, we believe in that, we support that, uh, and that is in the uh, Environment Bill. And uh, we, as I said, we'll shortly be publishing guidance on that. And the other principles that are included. Thank you. Uh, Ruth. Thank you. So the next question um, is about the creation of free ports and there's been speculation about what these might be including in the newspapers over the weekend. Can the Secretary of State reassure us that this would not be at the expense of environmental protections? Um, yes, because we have in place uh, both our marine conservation zones, um, but also in some of those areas we've got triple uh, SIs that are protected sites. Uh, around some of the ports we've got special areas of uh, conservation as well and um, these will uh, all be retained and uh, all of those designations are taken into account uh, when we have um, planning applications affecting ports and the MMO is the licensing authority in this area so we have quite a comprehensive suite of protections that are in place both through designations but also through uh, the licensing and permitting process uh, and those have um, those are being uh, you know retained and obviously uh, through any of those uh, applications uh, they would need to go through some of those um, some of those um, processes to get the necessary permits thank you uh, Ruth another one Thank you. So now building on some of the comments that Tanya in particular made about the connection between our global ambitions and um, domestic leadership, it's good to hear you talk about the UK's role in multilateral environmental agreements and pressing for nature-based solutions at COP26. That's very welcome. But before then, COP15 will determine a new framework for global nature targets where the UK could play a really important leadership role what will you do before then to demonstrate that the UK is going to make a legal commitment to bending the curve in nature's decline in the UK? Well, we will shortly be publishing a paper that uh, sets out uh, our initial thinking and our thoughts on, um, on those target setting, including on biodiversity. And, um, you know, my view on this is we, we need to be measuring biodiversity right across our landscape. So in particular, we need to uh, see improvements in some of those protected areas, but we also want to see improvements in the farmed landscape and also uh, you know, in some of our uh, peri-urban environments as well. So um, we ought to be having a, a suite of um, uh, targets and approaches that monitor and track biodiversity across uh, the landscape. And I think people will see that when we publish that uh, paper. Obviously, internationally, we're also doing quite a lot of work through the Blue Belt on the uh, overseas territories and through our ambition to do highly protected areas at home as well. And what I can tell you is that when it comes to CBD, um, you're absolutely right. Um, that is going to come ahead of COP26, but we've always um, viewed the two as being linked because we want to have nature-based solutions to climate change as a key part of the agenda, COP26. And we see actually what could be agreed uh, at CBD to get you know, meaningful um, commitments to targets on uh, biodiversity gain uh, as being uh, an important staging post on the way to COP26. And uh, Zach Goldsmith is doing quite a lot of work in this area uh, to, to establish exactly how we can make that happen. Thank you. Uh, Ruth, time for one more or perhaps two if you've got any journalist questions as well, but up to you. Um, so, so the next one is on the Environment Bill, and it was great to hear you say, Secretary of State, it's coming back in September. I think when the bill had its second reading, um, you said something like you would be open to good amendments on the bill. It won't surprise you that many of us have some suggestions for good amendments that would improve and clarify um, certain of the key provisions. Would you be willing to make some time over the summer to have a look at those amendments? And not now, but would you also be willing to have a conversation with us about the proposed clarifications you mentioned to the remedies uh, function of the OEP, because I think that would be of great interest to many organisations in the sector. Um, yes, uh, the short answer, I can do a very short answer there. Yes, if you've got um, suggestions and proposals, uh, I mean, obviously, I know uh, quite a lot of uh, amendments will have been tabled already, and um, there's been, you know, a, 
conscious there's been a, a long running debate and this bill was introduced previously as well. But I'm, I'm more than happy to consider any particular proposals people might have. Um, and, uh, and of course, um, if we get to the point that we've got some uh, additional amendments that we we're going to make, we can uh, certainly brief you on that. Uh, thank you, Ruth, and thanks to all the questioners. Uh, really quick last comments from, from uh, Tanya and Becky. I'll go in that order this time. Um, and, and Tanya, I just want to say, what, what do you want the Secretary of State to say? The one thing you'd like the Secretary of State to say, which would make you leave this event with a spring in your step. Or maybe he's already said it. I hope so. <laughs> I think um, what I would like the Secretary of State to do is to, um, we've heard manifesto commitments, we've heard intent, we would like to match commitments with clear targets and transparency. This is too big to fail and um, as we move through a whole range of legislative agendas, trade deals, it's to connect those two issues together, as I say, with targets and transparency to deliver. And we're anxious, I think, increasingly that some of the words and the pictures just don't match. And how can we start to bring them together so there is a, a ambitious um, plan and indeed set of actions and policies for the future that we can all deliver on? Thanks, Tanya. And Becky, what can the Secretary of State say to delight you? I would love to hear him say that um, the combination of the urgency now of the climate and, and ecological crisis and COVID and our response to COVID means that he absolutely puts nature at the heart of a resilient economy that means we've got healthy communities and we've got a, a thriving natural world. And that in order to do that, he personally undertakes to make sure that our, our legislative opportunities and our funding will match that ambition. It really is now or never, and this needs to be a turning point. And I would love to hear his personal commitment to making sure that ambition and that delivery absolutely matches the rhetoric. Thank you, Becky. So, Secretary, say if you could respond to those two points, and, and perhaps also just say if, when, when you leave uh, office as, uh, as Secretary of State, what would you like to be remembered for? What would be the big achievement you'd like to look back on? All right, I'll deal with the first two points first, and then come to um, to your question. Well, what I what I want from myself, I suppose, is the question. Um, I think um, on uh, Tanya's uh, points about having clear and transparent targets. Um, you'll get that. Uh, the Environment Bill provides for that to be done. And as I said, uh, we've got an initial consultation paper that we'll be talking to all of you about uh, very shortly to try to move that process forward. And there's quite, um, quite a lot of creative thinking that's going in uh, to that process. And I think, uh, I think you'll like and welcome uh, what we have to say there. Um, the other thing in terms of um, uh, Tanya's point again about you know, trade agreements and linking our ambitions for the environment and issues like animal welfare through that. Um, by the end of this month, we're going to have the uh, interim report on the food strategy by Henry Dimble be published. Uh, I recommend that you all read that. I think um, uh, it's, it's a very thorough piece of work that explores some of these complex um, uh, interactions and interconnected uh, challenges around our food, um, uh, the food industry and our food supply chain and its interaction with the environment. And I think, um, I think you will uh, find a lot in there that is, um, that's reassuring and that you're welcome. So I, I recommend you look at that. On Becky's um, uh, point uh, around funding, I would simply say the two things, transforming the agriculture policy, that two billion pounds a year for England, three billion uh, for the UK, uh, into a fund that is geared to transforming outcomes for wildlife and nature and biodiversity on our farmed landscape, I think is a real uh, game changer. And we need to keep our focus on that. And biodiversity net gain, in terms of unlocking uh, new funding, New, a new uh, potentially quite large source of green finance that can really uh, drive that uh, agenda for nature is another big game changer. Unlike, these are both unlike anything that we have done before on a scale uh, that we've uh, never, you know, never done uh, before. Uh, the, the elm 
project itself will mean, you know, something like 10 to 15 times more uh, money going to these types of objectives uh, than we've done uh, previously. And finally, Sean, um, what I would like to be remembered for, I think, is um, uh, having successfully demonstrated uh, not just to um, an apprehensive uh, public and apprehensive NGOs, but to the world at large that actually taking back control of these policy areas and having that freedom to innovate and try new things and do things differently uh, in 10 years time will be yielding real results uh, with those metrics on things like biodiversity and water quality moving in the right direction uh, and with the rest of the world wanting to come to the UK uh, to see how it's done and how we delivered it and to learn from the policy choices we put in place. That would be uh, my aim. You might think that's ambitious, but I think this is a once in a generation opportunity. We've not had a chance like this for half a century to truly shape imaginative policy in this area. That's what I'd like to do. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks everybody um, for, thanks to all the speakers, particularly the Secretary of State for uh, being so open and succinct, but thanks to the speakers, thanks to Ollie for organising and the DEFRA team. I apologise I've run over. I do want to just plug two events. We have an event uh, tomorrow with Greg Hans, the Minister for uh, Trade Policy at the Department of International Trade. Uh, that's at, I think, 10 a.m. Uh, look on the Green Alliance website. The DIT has been a kind of uh, dead zone for environmental thinking up till quite recently, and it's great that Greg Hans is coming out to speak. So please do, do come along to that. And on Thursday at 2.30, uh, Parth Professor Partha Dasgupta uh, we'll be speaking about the Descriptor Review with uh, Fiona Reynolds and, and Roger Gifford. So another great event. This event was, has been recorded. It'll be on the Green Alliance YouTube channel later today and probably turn into a podcast. And full details of all our events are on the Green Alliance website. So thanks very much to the audience. Uh, thanks to the Secretary of State and the respondents. And have a very good day, everybody. Bye-bye.